I'm delighted to welcome Lord Maud of Horsham, the former Minister of State for Trade and Investment, to PPMA TV and to thank him for his opening address earlier today. I think we all agree we live in very interesting times. You talked earlier about Brexit, but what do you see as the as the, um, is Theresa May the right person to deliver Brexit for Britain? I think she's incredibly well equipped to deliver a good outcome. She's hugely experienced, calm, sensible, pragmatic, uh, didn't have very strong preconceptions about what the outcome should be. And I think she'll do it really well. And she knows got a lot of the good relationships within the European Union. And I think she'll do it in a very sensible way. Do you think she'll lead the whole party with her? I think definitely. I mean, people know that there is a decision that's been made. Um, that there's a lot of different outcomes available, and we want one that is not kind of off the shelf, as I said earlier, not the Norway or the Canada or the Switzerland solution, something which, which works for us. We've got a different balance of um, interests. Uh, our economy is incredibly interlinked with the rest of the European Union. And so I think we can do a deal and get a deal which reflects British interests, but which will be very much in the interests of our European partners as well. Because you know they don't want Britain's economy to fail, because if there are problems for Britain, then that will pretty soon uh, carry across to the rest of the European Union. Certainly a lot of exhibitors here are very closely linked either with exporting, importing, um, there's UK branches, a lot of companies here. Are they right to be worried, do you think? I, I wouldn't say worried. <clears throat> They're right to be pretty interested. They're right to make sure that their voices are heard. I mean, that is the absolutely key thing. The government can't take account of business interests, which will di be different, will vary. Um, unless they hear what they are. So I think the voice of PPMA as the trade body is going to be incredibly important. The government will definitely want to listen to those views. And, you know, worried where there's change, there's opportunity. Of course, there's some downside risk. I said earlier, my own view of this was if we voted to leave, there's definitely some short term downside risk, but I think potentially some medium to long term upside. But how much of that there is, uh, it depends on how the government negotiates this. But whatever the outcome, there's just a premium on British businesses getting out there into the wider world markets, making sure that what they produce is top quality, is more and more value added, uh, and then I'm sure we'll win. You know, this country lives and dies by its trade. We're a very heavily traded economy, and that's been our strength over the years. And there'll be more opportunity, not less in the future, I think. So you think more opportunity? I think definitely. I mean, clearly the pattern of trade will shift, um, but not necessarily uh, in the way that people have expected. Our share of trade, the amount of our trade that is with the rest of the EU has been falling in recent years um, and has been growing with the rest of the world. That may be accentuated. We don't know. But I mean, it, as, as uh, an exporter, what businesses should be doing is looking for opportunity wherever it is. And sometimes that will be in unexpected places. Uh, and there was an assumption when we were completing, as I say, 30 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, I was negotiating the single market relationships uh, arrangements in the Thatcher government. And all of the sense was that we're going to see a much bigger growth in trade within the single market. Well, we've seen that. It's fallen off a bit, but actually we should always have been looking for where the opportunities are in the global market because this is a single, increasingly this is going to be a single global market with single global standards and the world is, is our oyster. You mentioned earlier in your presentation or it was spoken about the Commonwealth as being an opportunity as well. Yes, it is. I thought it was a very interesting question uh, I was asked. The Commonwealth is a network of more than 50 countries. Uh, we have uh, some strong common heritage. Um, English, they're English-speaking countries with a similar basis of law, the common law, um, systems of government that we would recognize. And 
uh, and there is a network, there is a bond. And the thing which I think it's always worth stressing, because we underestimate this, is just how much goodwill there is to Britain around the world. That's true in the Commonwealth in particular, but much more widely as well. And sometimes we Brits, we can be very self-deprecating. Um, and sometimes the nuances of us being self-deprecating get lost. I think we need to be much more out there, much more proud of what it is we are and what we do, and project it. Because I, the sense I had around the world is there's such a sense of prestige, of cachet, of quality that attaches to what's produced in Britain. And we can exploit that. Another key um, issue that faces this particular sector is skill shortages yeah. and young people coming into the industry. I mean, what's your view on how government can help this kind of industry with that issue? Well, I think the first point is that apprenticeships, this huge growth in apprenticeships, has been very beneficial. And apprenticeships are not quite what uh, in my generation grew up understanding them to be when, you know, you, you, not very many people of my generation went to university. It was only 10% of school leavers. Many more would go into apprenticeships. Now I think the boundaries are much more blurred. Uh, you have many more apprenticeship apprentices who go on to get a degree. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an incredibly valuable thing. And I think for a lot of young people today, the prospect of working and being paid while you get your degree and coming out of it with a qualification, with a job and no debt, that's very attractive. And I think that's going to be very much more the way of the future. Certainly as a parent of someone at university, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, well, my youngest is still at university, but um, the youngest of five, so the rest of the other four are all out now, <laughs> but with a load of debt. <laughs> So also, how do you think government can help in innovation and creativity in when small to medium-sized businesses, which are a lot in this hall, um, struggle to get any kind of funding or help yeah. to, to in that area? Well, I think that there is help available. Uh, I mean, just going around the show today, talking to various businesses who've seen uh, benefit from R&D tax credits, benefits from the patent box, which is, gives a very advantageous rate of tax when you go through registering uh, a, a new patent. I think that's been very beneficial. That's stimulated a lot of activity. And I know from talking to international businesses that they see that as a key uh, point of attraction for making the UK a real destination for investment uh, in R&D and innovation. Yeah. I think the other things, I think one of the things the coalition government was very good at. And I would give lots of credit to Vince Cable, who was the business secretary during that time. This idea that, you know, where we have a sector that's very strong, um, like automotive, like uh, uh, aerospace, where we have the second biggest aerospace sector in the world, second only to the United States, then there are things that the government can do. We're not going to go back to the old days of the 1970s and 60s of picking winners, but we can say here's a sector we're strong at, where the government can work with the sector to develop new solutions and to invest. And so I've been to a number of the catapults around the country, to the advanced research centers, which are very much joint ventures between the government, the public sector, and private industry. And I think there is much that can be done uh, but, I mean, we need to keep this going and not assume, you know, this is only down to business. Governments won't create the innovations, by and large. We will be funding, we will continue to fund uh, research in the universities. And it is, again, one of the huge selling points of this country that we have some of the very best universities in the world. Um, you know, and uh, typically the rankings of the ten best universities in the world Six or seven will be American, three or four will be British, yeah, yeah. UK universities. That's a huge attraction. And the spin-outs that come out of that research in those great universities, and it isn't just those top three or four, it's the whole of the research. And, and you know, with universities that uh, aren't that well known, developing re re serious specialities, yeah. I think this is, again, it's a very rich tapestry 
of innovation, of research, which again can help to make Britain a fantastically attractive destination for investment. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time and for coming to the show today. And that's all for now on PPMA TV. Mm -hmm.